If there's one thing that I believe in, it's doing the right thing for the people who do right by you. And so the whole point of us being here today is so we can learn from each other. So this presentation I'm about to deliver to you, the State of the League in 2015, is a look back on the history of student hackathons, uh, what we accomplished together as a community in 2014, and a brief glimpse into the future and what that holds. Um, so 2015, oh, and also, like, Basically, I'm opening up for probably one of the greatest speakers ever, Rob Spector, who's going to be going right after this. I'm just going to hype, hype his talk up <laughs> extra much. Uh, Rob was one of the, the best speakers from HackCon last year, and I'm really excited to see what he has in store for us this year. So uh, once I'm done talking, you guys will get to hear that. So I'll, I'll try to move through pretty quickly. So uh, this has been a huge year for student hackathons, huge. I mean, you could just look around this room and realize that there are over 200 hackathon organizers sitting here in these chairs. Uh, last year at HackCon, we sold out with 100 tickets. Honestly, I think if we would have had 300 tickets this year, we probably could have sold out almost all of them as well. Uh, and the truth is, this is a rapidly growing community, and there's a reason for that. It's because every single person in this room cares. They care about student hackers. They care about the ability for people to shape the future, to build. They know how powerful technology is and what an enabler it is. And that's what brings us all together today. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to take you guys on a journey. I want to take you on a journey back to 2010, back when student hackathons first got their start, uh, back when uh, we, we didn't have all of the, the wonderful things we do today. And I want to then walk all the way up into 2014 and give you guys a sneak peek of, of what I think is in store. So. Believe it or not, I have been going to student hackathons since the second ever student hackathon. Uh, that was back in 2010 at Hack and Why. Uh, back then, it used to be just a handful of people in a room. Honestly, there were less people competing in that first hackathon than there were in this room right now, which is insanity. That means there's more hackathon organizers today than there were hackers back then. Uh, we didn't have fancy prizes. We definitely did not have travel reimbursements. We didn't have any of the amazing stuff I'm going to show you today. Uh, it was really simple. And you know, back then there was one thing that really brought us all together, and I think it still brings us all together today, and it's that we have a community, a community that's passionate about building. None of us were there because we thought that hackathons were gonna like, change our lives. We were there because we wanted to build cool software, and that still holds true today. Uh, but the thing is, in the process of building cool software, amazing things happened. Uh, hackathons changed my life. They changed them a lot. I mean, I could have been a lawyer, believe it or not. How many people in this room have heard that story? A lot of you. <laughs> I've probably told that story to 20,000 people at this point in my life, believe it or not. Uh, but I could have been a lawyer, and I'll tell you, I will tell it again uh, just for, for whatever sake. Uh, but I ended up in CS somehow. Uh, and through finding my way into CS and being so inspired by that first hackathon, uh, I even ended up evangelizing the community and helping to get more people into hackathons at SunGrid. Uh, I also started something that was, I guess, somewhere around the neighborhood of the first ever platform for hackathons. Uh, so hackathons are something I've been working on for a long time. I've been working on them since day one of, of what, you know, being so inspired. Uh, but the thing I'm probably most widely known for right now, I guess, is Major League Hacking, right? Uh, believe it or not, Major League Hacking started with these two fools uh, in an igloo in Berlin. <laughs> both, <laughs> both my last companies started in igloos. That's a true statement. Um, but hackathons changed John and I's lives. Uh, and the thing is, we both know how powerful they were, and we want to take that, and we want to make it accessible to everyone. And that's why we're working on this, is because we believe in the power that hackathons have, and we want to make sure that every single student out there has the same opportunities that we did. And I fundamentally believe that if you are in this room, you believe that same thing. Uh, so we launched in fall of 2013. Actually, Alexa, who's in this room right now, is, is one of the people who inspired me to even work on this in the first place, which is pretty awesome. I also remember calling Rob and being like, hey, do you think this is even a good idea? Should I be wasting my time with this? And he also said it was, I should do it. But I launched in fall of 2013 with five events. And back then, Major League Hacking was not a company. Uh, it was just me with a crazy idea, sleeping on people's ho hotel room floors, uh, just trying to inspire more kids to get into hackathons. Uh, by the time I made it to the spring, I went from the five events to 40 that were banging down my door to be a part of the league. And I knew that it would be a full-time thing for both me and John. Uh, so a lot of amazing stuff happened since that time in 2013. Uh, you know, we went from, from those five events to just 40 in the spring alone. That's just the spring. Uh, and we went from two organizers way back in 2010 to 200 organizers sitting in this room here today. Uh, so let's take a walk through all the crazy stuff that happened in this last year alone. 
Uh, now, a lot of the data that I'm going to share with you today is actually just from the fall. <laughs> Back in January, this time last year, Major League Hacking was just me. So uh, we've had a lot of opportunity over the last year to like start collecting real data, and, and I have some really interesting stuff I'm going to share with you. But keep in mind, a lot of the numbers that we get along to will be more than double if we were collecting since the spring. Uh, so speaking of the spring, in the spring season, we had 34 sanctioned events. Uh, that means there were 34 hackathons that took place in U.S. and Canada in the spring of 2014. Now, I was able to attend 10 of them out of 34, uh, which, and it was awesome. And I, I tell you what, like going there, I was so inspired and seeing things like the first ever big student hackathon on the West Coast uh, really told me the story of how awesome things uh, you know, we're going to get in the future. And we went from those 34 events in the spring to 50 in the fall. That's 84 total events in 2014 that are sanctioned. Now, this is not even including local hack days, which we'll talk about in a little bit. That's 84 student hackathons that you guys in this room helped organize. Uh, that includes the US, Canada, Mexico, and the UK. That's insanity. And if you expand to the student hackathons that are happening in other countries, I mean, the number just keeps getting crazier. That's over a 10x increase in events between 2013 and 2014. Uh, over 30,000 combined participations across all of those events. And we had 10% of all of the higher education institutions in North America participate in an event. At least one person from those schools. That's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. And that's in one year. Imagine what it's going to be like next year. So given all this crazy growth that's happening in student hackathons, like what was Major League Hacking doing, right? I talked about how I think this movement is so important and how I'm dedicating my life to help them grow the movement and make sure it's sustainable in the future. Uh, so what are we working on? Well, we spent a lot of time talking to you guys. Uh, how many people did I speak to in the last year? On the phone, in person, talk to you about your hackathon. A lot of people in this room. And if you bring it out to the whole MOH team, we spend almost every waking hour thinking about you guys and talking to you about your problems and what we can do to help solve them. And the truth is there's one thing that really categorizes what we worked on, and it's this idea of equality of quality. Major League Hacking stands for this idea of inclusivity. We believe that every single student has the right to hack. They de deserve to have access to high quality developer events where they can build software, where they can learn things, where they can meet other awesome people just like you guys. Uh, and the truth is, regardless of their socioeconomic status, regardless of where they live, regardless of their gender, their race, whatever, it doesn't matter, they should have access to those things. So a lot of things we worked on this year was taking this idea of everybody being able to have access to these high quality events and translating it so that we had a baseline that everybody could come to expect as somebody attending a sanctioned event, Major League Hacking. Uh, everybody should be able to have basic quality. They should have access to things that I'll go over in a few seconds, but uh, one of the ways we did this is we came up with this basic list of perks that we thought represented the values that we wanted to see at hackathons. And we didn't just do them at a few. I mean, back in the spring, there was just 10 events I could go to. But in the fall, we translated into literally every single event in the season. That's over 50 events. Uh, one of the things we did is on-site, have a lot of on-site support, right? We know that putting on a hackathon is hard. Everybody in this room knows that putting on a hackathon is hard. Um, we want to be the Alfred to your Batman. We want to make sure that when, when something goes wrong or that you need our help, we are there. We are ready and waiting and, and are able to do whatever you need. I mean, organizers ask us to do things like buy last minute food, uh, <laughs> take, take, uh, interact with angry sponsors who might not be being rational at a, at a given time, take out the trash, both literally and figuratively, <laughs> coaching the judges, whatever, right? I mean, uh, organizers ask us to do anything. And the directive that we give to every MLH representative who goes to one of your events is that if there is something that an organizer needs, it is your responsibility to try to fill in the gaps. And we love helping hackers. You know, in our downtime, we're not helping organizers. We're doing some stuff to help inspire hackers the same way that, you know, when John and I were evangelizing for Sengren and Twilio, we were doing for those companies. Uh, we believe it's really important, and we believe it makes the difference. And I'm really proud to say that we had 100% event coverage by MLH representatives in the fall. Uh, that was from 10 events in the spring to 100% in the fall. That's over 2,000 hours of in-person activity at hackathons helping with support organizers and hackers. Uh, and the other thing is, Major League Hacking is becoming the destination for students to find out about hackathons. Uh, and again, like the idea here is that we want to just set a bar for quality. I, I don't know if any of you guys have had this experience, but back in, in the early days of student hackathons, I remember going to events 
and uh, several times walking away and being like, that was one of the worst organized events I've ever been to as an attendee, right? And, and the thing we want to get a away from is we want to make sure that like when an attendee goes to the Major League Hacking website, and they may not have ever been to a hackathon before, they may not even know what they're missing out on, but we want to know that when they click one of those links, when they go to one of your websites, that they can expect quality. They can expect to be treated right. They can expect to have access to really high quality stuff. And that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to help get the word out. Uh, hackers are starting to see MLH as a stamp of quality. Uh, we're our platform for new events to get discovered. Uh, sponsors, sponsors are anxiously emailing us trying to find out when the next events are. They know how good you guys are at putting on events. And we want to be the platform to help get the word out. Over 25,000 unique people got referred in the fall alone to your events. Uh, I remember being on the phone with Dan from, from Wild Hacks, and he told me, I asked him how signups were going for his event, and he said, well, we haven't actually published the signup page at all, but we have over 400 signups, and they all came from the Major League Hacking website. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that's crazy. But yeah, it's definitely becoming a destination. And the truth is we want to help events that maybe don't have a reputation, maybe that have, are just starting out. Uh, we want to help get the word out, and we want to help hackers find out about the stuff that's going on near them. Another thing we, we believe in is that hackers should have access to the latest and greatest technology. Uh, I remember being a student, and I remember you know, seeing all kinds of awesome stuff that I could have, and realizing that I was living paycheck to paycheck, and if I went out and I bought something like an Arduino, that I wasn't going to be able to afford my textbooks. Right? I mean, that sounds ridiculous because we, you know, we're developers and we, you know, we know how much money you can make like contracting and freelancing, but if you roll back the clock a couple years, that, that was not always the thing. And the truth is there's a lot of people out there today that still don't have the same opportunities that a lot of the people in this room are fortunate enough to have. And that's something we need to be actively thinking about. Uh, often we suffer from the curse of knowledge where we you know, just picture people in the same light as ourselves. Uh, but the truth is not everybody can afford things like an Oculus Rift or a Mayo. And I'll tell you what, you know, if you can't afford it and you think you're going to go out and buy it but you've never even tried it before, there's a huge barrier to entry. So we believe that like, by bringing the latest and greatest hardware to all of these events and letting hackers learn to use it beforehand, getting to try before they buy, they can actually make smart decisions, they can figure out what kind of things they're passionate about, and they can get inspired with the stuff before they go out and they dump their whole paycheck on something. And even if they don't want to do that, they still have access to it every single time they go to a major league hacking event. Uh, the worst thing is that you, know, you think that maybe like, having hard, not having hardware is not the end of the world, but the truth is I think it's a disservice to those hackers who don't even know what they're missing out on. Uh, we brought a lot of really cool stuff. Some of the, we listened to you and asked you know, what your favorite devices were, and we brought those. I mean, everybody knows Oculus Rift. We brought Alienware computers for people who don't necessarily have graphics cards to run those. Um, Spark cores, Arduinos, Mayos, Teslas, Pebbles, pretty much anything you can imagine. And we're always looking for new devices to help bring to hackers, help get them inspired, and teach them new technology. Um, Hardware Lab is probably one of our most successful initiatives we did hook on last semester, and it was just totally a fluke. It was opportunity that we saw and, and something that you guys told us to do. Uh, I'm really, really glad that we listened. We checked out over 3,000 devices across the fall season. Uh, that's just the fall. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. Uh, and we're working to get that distributed globally and make the same things that are accessible in the U.S. accessible to the other places we're going to. Uh, that's nearly 100 devices per event, by the way, which is <laughs> insane. Another thing that, that we believe in uh, is making sure that hackers, you know, well, so let me back up a step. Prizes are not everything. You know, the truth is we all probably know that hackers don't go to hackathons to win prizes. They go there to learn, they go there to have a good time, they go there to get you know, all the value that we know in this community exists. Um, so while they're not the main motivator for hackathons, we do believe that hackers should be recognized for the great stuff they build. Uh, and, but the thing is, you know, not every event may have access to give out that stuff that, to help reward those hackers for what they're doing. Uh, so we partnered up with some awesome companies like Dell, Mayo, Leap Motion to help provide basic prizing to every single event to make sure that you guys can recognize those hackers even if you don't have it necessarily in your budget. Uh, we gave out over a thousand prizes and medals last semester alone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I remember being at Rutgers and when the Rutgers Hackathon Club was just starting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember like we always thought we were going to get t-shirts but we could never actually like afford it because the club was dramatically underfunded and we barely had enough money to afford gas to go to hackathons let alone be able to buy t-shirts. Uh, but the truth is like school spirit is one of the best ways to inspire new people to get involved in your community. Uh, we believe that that you know a lot of the difference between people who go to hackathons and those who don't is the fact that you know they might not see it as accessible or they might not know about it so it might be a, a marketing problem in a lot of ways. And one of the best ways to help get the word out is to enable people to broadcast what they do that's awesome. 
Uh, we printed branded, uh, like club branded jerseys for a ton of hackers, for thousands of them literally, regardless of how their club's notoriety was, how big it was, uh, how successful it was. Uh, and we you know, even gave, <laughs> highlighted hackers by printing their last names on the back of them. Uh, we printed over 2,500 jerseys for hackers last semester. Uh, we also know that, that hackers love taking a break from, from coding. I remember being a developer at hackathons. I remember actually Node Knockout in 2011, sitting there for 48 hours. My first 48 hour hackathon back then, because it used to be just 24 hour events. And I remember sitting at this computer screen for 48 hours, and I was exhausted. And I got the brilliant idea to convert our entire code base from JavaScript to CoffeeScript, even though I was the only person who knew CoffeeScript at all. And uh, we got to this point where everybody was just like banging their heads on the keyboard and you know, frustrated beyond belief at each other. And I just said, let's just take a break. And we got up and we went out and went to down to the pier in San Francisco and, and got clam chowder. Uh, and like came back, and then we were, you know, sat down and resolved the problem. But the truth is, if we would have just continued sitting there, looking at each other and fighting, like we wouldn't have gotten anywhere. So we all know that like taking breaks from coding can be a really important component, and having fun things for hackers to do and ways for them to engage with sponsors and other attendees is is especially good. I mean, not everybody is outgoing. Not everybody, ha you know, is is as actively seeking to ha engage with other people as they could be. And mini events are a great way to help get people away from the screen and talking to each other. Uh, and not all hackathons can afford these things though, right? Like you could see the bigger hackathons a couple semesters ago and they were able to afford fun things that for hackers to do like ice cream trucks and whatever. Uh, but we wanted to provide a baseline. We wanted to enable every single hackathon of the season to have access to these same things. Um, so we organized over 60 mini events uh, in the fall semester. A lot of your favorites you guys will probably recognize like laser tag. This is a painting mural I designed for Hack Texas, cupcakes. Uh, one of the most successful things we did was bring in the photo booth. Uh, apparently, hackers love taking photos of themselves. <laughs> it's like selfie culture all over again. Um, <laughs> they took over 1,200 photos across 10 events in that photo booth, which is a nightmare to set up, by the way. <laughs> if you look at all the albums, like the first one or two in every album is like me with a clicker trying to fix the damn photo booth. So. Uh, so speaking of photos, uh, another thing that we believe is that you know hackers should be able to m remember their experiences at hackathons uh, beyond just their memories. Uh, having photos at events is something that you would think you know is pretty standard, but the truth is it's something either organizers are so busy that they uh, forget about it, slips through the cracks, or maybe they can't even afford to hire a photographer. Uh, we're lucky enough to have one of the best event photographers in the world with us today, Matt. Where's your name, Matt? Give it up for Matt. Uh, but the truth is, like, w we wanted to make enable this for all events, right? So MLH commissioned photographers took over 7,500 photos at your events this semester. They're all on Facebook. They're all open. Anyone can use those photos. And I tell you what, when you need to tell a school administrator a story about what a hackathon is, those photos are one of the best ways to explain it. And there's some really good stuff, and we've focused on making the photos as diverse as possible, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But, you know, they're definitely for you to use. Another thing we, di we did was uh, commission video. Uh, we love to tell hackers stories to the world and help them, you know, get the word out about what they're doing. Uh, it, it video is also another really important component for inspiring new people to join the community. Uh, and also, like, hackers who can't afford to go to these events, hackers who couldn't take off the time from class, they could still feel like they're a part of this community by watching these videos and seeing what everybody made. Uh, we also did a bunch of live streams and stuff, which I'll talk about, too. Uh, but it's also a great way to show your family and friends what they're doing, right? Uh, we had over 182,000 minutes of video watched this semester. That's literally four months of people watching videos continuously without a break. That's insane. Uh, it's definitely a new definition of binge watching for sure. Uh, another thing is we know how hard it is for events to gain legitimacy with sponsors, their school administrators. Uh, you know, one of the best ways to fix that problem is to have is for press, right? Like you can take that to a school administrator or sponsor and say, hey, look, the press wrote about us last semester. Uh, we hired a PR firm to help get placements for your events. We had over 100 placements in some of these outlets that you guys are definitely familiar with. Uh, it's about 40 placements a month uh, for you guys. And local press ate up this stuff. I wish I could play this video for you of, uh, of NBC with the people being like, you wouldn't believe what these hackers are doing. And no, they're not breaking into your computer. So we did a lot of stuff. Uh, MLH perks are definitely not feature complete. We're always looking to get better. We're always asking for your feedback. This is just the start. Uh, and the truth is we're gonna continue to evolve with the community and keep listening to you. Um, so constantly looking for ideas. If you have anything, we would love to hear it. Another thing we worked on uh, 
uh, <laughs> this semester is, is Local Hack Day. Uh, you know, we obviously were listening and caring about perks, but something we heard from the community uh, was that there weren't enough events that were like a safe place for them to get in introduced to hacking. I remember actually, funny story, <laughs> HackCon last year, uh, this guy, Shy, where are you, Shy? He's over there in the corner. Yeah. So I, I remember Shy came up to me last year. He'd never organized a hackathon in his life. And he said, and he was worried about uh, the big events drowning out the smaller events that were really important for getting new people into the community. Uh, <laughs> and he, he petitioned me this idea about local hack day. And I remember saying to him, like, oh, that's a pretty cool idea, dude. If you want to do it, like, I'll help you. And le uh, literally about a year later, he organized local hack day. Uh, it's pretty, in pretty incredible how far things have come. So uh, Local Hack Day is a 12-hour educational event that I designed to help people get their first experience at hackathons, whether that be an organizer who's never organized an event before, who wants a simple, uh, repeatable event that they can try out, or a student who might not want to take a 12-hour bus ride to the middle of nowhere to spend 36 hours without a shower thinking about <laughs> what they're going to be doing. Um, so it's a foot in the door. Um, Shai helped coordinate over 30 local hack days across the U.S. and Canada. <laughs> 1,200 hackers participated simultaneously in that day. Uh, we're really proud of all the first-time attendees and organizers. You guys did a great job. Um, we we want to make this available to more people in, in the future. We want to help you know be a really good introduction for first-time hackers. Another thing we heard from the community is that hackers outside the U.S. are really underserved. Uh, w you know, obviously, if you I'll show you guys a, a, a map later about where all the hackathons are, but. The East Coast specifically, there's tons of stuff going on. But if you look at the, the world on, on a global scale, it, it's not necessarily available in a lot of other places. Uh, so one of the first things we did in the fall semester was launch uh, the MLH UK season. Uh, we joined forces with some of the brightest hackers in the UK to help put this on. MLH UK, where are you guys at? Let's give it up for them. <laughs> they literally like blew us away. Um, you know. Yeah, I learned a lot about how different the UK community is from the US. Like, you wouldn't believe the differences. I remember sitting down for like a 30 minute presentation when Tim, the UK commissioner, explained the difference between college in the UK and college in the US and why we needed to change our branding. Um, but yeah, they did a great job. Uh, we kicked it off with this thing called Launch Hack to help inspire organizers and set a bar for what other hackathons could look to. Uh, attendees have told us it was their favorite event of the season. In total, we had 10 uh, sanctioned events the first season in the UK. For comparison, in 2013, we only had eight in the U.S. Uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. Over 1,500 hackers participated in the season. It's only going to get bigger from here. We're really proud of those guys. They did a great job. Uh, another thing that, yeah, didn't we say we were a league? Uh, we, we have this thing called the Hacker Cup you might not be aware of. Um, so basically, like, the first season that we, we existed in 2013, you know, one of the ideas was that it would be a meta competition on top of all the hackathons. Uh, and that we would like basically award hackers for bringing their friends to events. And it worked out really well in the fall. Maryland won. We're really proud of them. You guys did awesome. Uh, we had like a great ceremony. And you know, I remember g going there and meeting all the school administrators, like shaking the dean's hand or whatever. And like uh, they got a, a you know, all those administrators were gung ho about them organizing their first event. They helped them with BitCamp. Um, <laughs> later on, they got a huge multi-million dollar donation from Oculus Rift that somehow connected that. So. It was pretty cool, uh, but we didn't do rankings in the spring, and that was because basically it was just me, and I had no idea what I was getting myself into, and I was completely overwhelmed, and I screwed that up. Uh, but we did bring them back for the fall, and we learned a lot about uh, the algorithm we had and how it didn't scale, and we wanted to optimize it for some really things, some things that we really believe are, are valuable for the community. Uh, the truth is that that um, you know, we, we want to award hackers for going out and like helping get other people involved. So the rankings are designed around this idea of a group of hackers from a certain school going to a wide number of hackathons, uh, and and you know not necessarily just based around winning. In fact, it's actually probably more geared towards how many different events you go to as a community rather than than just the ones you win. So we optimize for that. Um, and actually, UIUC, who's in this room, uh, won the <laughs> fall 2014 season. We're going to go out there for, for a ceremony like when we did at Maryland in a, in a couple of months. Uh, we'll be engraving their name on the Hacker Cup. Uh, also, MLH and Dell are going to be hooking them up with some really crazy hacker gear for everybody in the club. Uh, it's going to be awesome. I'm really excited about that. So generally, 2014 was a year of equalization and making the, the equal quality across as many events as possible and helping 
bring the, the experience that we all know is so important to as many hackers as we could. Uh, we're always looking to get better. Uh, 2014 is just the start. So let's look ahead now. Let's look at 2015. Uh, this is going to be an even bigger and better year than last year. Uh, so first uh, thing we did in 2015 was introduce a new commissioner. Where are you, Nick? There he is. Hey, Nick. We started off by announcing our new commissioner, Nick. Uh, I know a lot of you guys probably know him as, as like fun, awesome, engaging Nick. Uh, I've known Nick since we h hired him at SendGrid right before I left. Uh, the, the, the side of Nick I know is that he is one of the most passionate, engaged, diligent people I have ever met in my life. Uh, and he's always, always, always looking to get better at anything he's doing. I remember <laughs> having just met the guy, now I don't really know him at all. He, <laughs> he emails me or calls me or something and he's like, hey, uh, I'm just getting started as an evangelist and I really want to get better. Uh, we're going to have a call every week where I'm going to tell you what I did this week and you're going to tell me what I did wrong and how I can improve. And I'm like, I don't know about that, man. Like, I don't really know you. I'm not sure if that's a good idea. And he's like, no, I'll send you a calendar invite. We'll talk on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> that's a true story. Uh, and he's been hard at work optimizing how we support you guys in the community. So far, he's, he's helped us sanction 52 events for the spring alone. Uh, that's a 1.5 increase a 1.5x increase from last spring. Uh, we have eight EU events, 44 North American events. Uh, we have over 100 more events in the pipeline, uh, which is insane. That's three times as many as there were in the pipeline last spring. Uh, 30 EU, 72 US, North America. Uh, we s Nick has had over 189 meetings this year with event organizers like yourselves. Uh, We've dedicated 1,500 uh, hours on site at events already. If we sanction any, as many of the events in the pipeline as I think we will, uh, that will easily triple. Uh, we're guessing in the spring we'll have about 25,000 hackers participate. Uh, and in the year of 2015, I think we're thinking it's going to be around 50,000, which is huge. Uh, there's going to be a lot more insight into that from in Nick's talk later on. So, pretty good. Uh, I'm happy with it. Another thing we worked on in 2015 is setting standards. Uh, I've talked a lot about inclusivity and about like why it's important for hackers to have this baseline good experience. Uh, so we want to make hackathons as, as baseline inclusive as possible. Uh, and another thing that we really wanted to focus on is helping make hackathons more accessible as a concept to the mainstream. I mean, I've been working on hackathons <laughs> since 2010. That's five years now. And if you ask my mother what a hackathon is, she would still not be able to explain it to you. <laughs> so. Uh, and, and the other thing is, you know, there's another reason that, that this is kind of important too for, you know, you'd think, all right, well, your mom probably doesn't need to be able to explain a hackathon. But the truth is, like, all it takes is one person to make a difference. I mean, all of you have heard that story about me being dragged to my first hackathon by a friend who, you know, found out I was a programmer. Uh, and the truth is, all it takes is one person to, t to bring somebody else to, to an event. And so, you know, making hackathons more accessible as a concept and more inclusive as a community is only going to help us continue to grow. Uh, so one of the things that we did was we launched this thing called the Code of Conduct, that I'm oh sorry, the Sanctioning Guide, uh, which basically sets expectations about what hackers can expect from sanctioned events. Uh, basically, like, we took all of the best practices that we've seen you as organizers do, uh, things that, like, we saw work out for events really well, and we put them into this guide that basically establishes a baseline for how to behave. Uh, we think that it's really good for uh, helping, you know, set a, a s high quality standards that hackers can expect, but it also still is flexible enough to allow you guys to be different, uh, which we think is also really, really important. So um, setting standards is really good. Also, we did this thing called the Code of Conduct. We obviously want to set a baseline for what behavior is acceptable at our events, uh, and we want to do that across the entire community. Uh, obviously, we want to have a professional and standardized reporting mechanism for people. Uh, you know, it's all the MOH staff are trained into how to handle incidents, and you don't have to see them in class tomorrow, which is a really important thing that you probably don't even think about. But, um, you know, we think this is something that's really valuable and important for our community. And, you know, incidents are truthfully no longer isolated just to one event, right? Having a centralized reporting system and a, a standardized practice across all of the events means that we can look at macro trends and figure out where things are breaking down. Um, so I think this is really valuable for our community, and it's only going to help us get better and be more inclusive. Another thing that we worked on is, is again, I, I kind of alluded to this before, is taking hackathons more mainstream, and making our community more diverse, and, and then lowering the barrier to entry. Um, so I don't know if you guys saw this, but we uh, live streamed uh, the joint uh, demos of MHAX and PenApps from this spring. Uh, anybody, c any event, any hacker can now go on Twitch and cr you know create a stream and stream under the Major League Hacking 
game, which is awesome. So you know, you'll, hackers will have a place where they can go and, and you know consume hackathon uh, demos or you know code casting or whatever. Uh, over eighty thousand people tuned into that live stream. That's absurd. <laughs> it's if you think about it, that's thirty six times the audience of M Hacks and Penhaps combined, uh, and it's also dramatically larger than our last live stream. We had 1,800 peak concurrence during the stream. Uh, the largest live stream we had before that was 200. So <laughs> it's a pretty dramatic increase. Uh, we d I don't really know what this means in, in context, so I asked the guy from Twitch, or John asked the guy from Twitch. Uh, basically, if anything over 1,500 peak concurrence for your first time streaming is ridiculous. Uh, so it means that hackers really care about this, and the community really cares about this, and this can be a really valuable thing. Uh, so we should really work together as a community to help take the stuff that we're doing and help showcase it to the world. So 2015 is going to be a busy year. This is just the start. We're literally only a month in. This is the first month, right? Like we're just getting through January. Uh, I can't believe how good things are looking, and I'm really excited for what we're going to do. Um, there's tons of new organizers, tons of new hackers. It's going to be great. So let's talk about announcements. I got some cool stuff I'm going to share with you today. Specifically, I have three awesome announcements to share. Uh, there's going to be a lot more this weekend, but this is just the start. So number one. Uh, we're going to go even more global. Uh, we already talked about how hackers having access to events in the US is like, it's pretty standard. Like in the East Coast, especially, there's tons of them. But when you take the view and you zoom out to the whole world, that's not necessarily the true. There's still tons of student hackers out there who don't even have access to any events, let alone hackathons, and let alone high quality ones. So the first thing we're doing is we're expanding to Europe. Uh, the MOS UK team was incredibly successful in bringing 10 hackathons to the UK last semester. Uh, now we're going to plant the seeds in a countries outside of the UK. Uh, we've already announced eight events for the EU season uh, for the spring. We have a ton more in the pipeline. Uh, I know there's a lot of events. I actually had the pleasure of meeting the guys who are organizing uh, the hackathon in Spain at PenApps. So this is going to be a really exciting time for Europe. Uh, it's going to be a really time exciting time for student hackers uh, all over the world. Another thing we're doing is we're expanding to Mexico and North America. Uh, wait, hang on. Let's give a shout out to the EU team. Where are you guys at? <laughs> All right. If you guessed, we're going to Mexico. Um, so last, last semester, we did a pilot uh, event in Mexico, which was awesome. We, when we went down there, we saw ex how excited and passionate those hackers were. And we hooked up with a bunch of, of awesome guys, including Juan Pablo, who's here. Where are you, Juan? Uh, he might be out front. He's actually out front checking people in still. Um, but when you go up there, make sure you say hello. I know we have some other Mexican hackathon organizers here. They're in the back over there. Let's give it up for our Mexican ha hackathon organizer friends. So we're going even more global as a community. And again, I think that the truth is, you know, while we have a, a widespread coverage in the East Coast of the U.S., we can do even better domestically too. So globalization is one thing, but increased coverage domestically is also another. So always be looking for people who you can get excited about organizing hackathons. Always be looking to grow this community because it's only going to help hackers get even more access. Number two, uh, we have a brand new resource uh, for, for hackathon organizers to help them organize even better events. Uh, so I mentioned we spent a lot of time talking to you guys, a lot of time on the phone, a lot of time covering the same questions that everybody has. I mean, as a first time event organizer myself, I've asked the same questions that we hear constantly. Um, but we're not really good at disseminating tribal knowledge, the knowledge that, that you know, we have that's like the baseline expectation of how to organize a high quality student hackathon like you guys do. Uh, so we put a lot of thought and hours into it. Uh, and we're, you know, we want to help provide a resource that any first time organizer or even established organizers who already have organized events before and just want to get better can turn to. Uh, so we're launching a guide. Now this is the compilation of all of the stuff that we've been learning from you guys into a single format. And now this is, remember, this is a beta. This is a first draft. Uh, what we did is we basically compiled it into this guide, which you can find at guide.moh.io. Uh, it's a living document. It's on GitHub. You can actively add you know, pull requests. You can have discussions around what's in there. We're looking to get better, and it belongs to you, not us. And you know, the only way that we're going to be able to continue growing as a community is if we invest all the knowledge that we transfer here at HackCon into a way that even the people who couldn't afford to be here this weekend can consume. Uh, so I highly, 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 highly encourage you all to go read it. I highly encourage you to contribute, and I would love to hear what you think. Uh, again, we think this is going to be really important for helping get more hackathon organizers out there involved in putting on high-quality student events and helping all of us get better. Yes. Right. Okay, guide, yes. Number three, 
two MLH events coming in 2015. Uh, obviously, we did a couple last semester and or last year, and they were really successful. Um, the first one is we're going to have an, a follow-up event to the success of our Launch Hack event in the UK, but this time for Greater Europe. Uh, it's codenamed Landing right now, and it'll be coming this spring. Uh, we want to set an example and inspire hackers and organizers in the EU to how to put on really great events. So landing will be coming to the EU this spring. We're also bringing back local hack day after a huge success in the fall. Uh, we're going to start. We're going to try to do it earlier this year to help get uh, students onboarded into the community from day zero. Um, we're really excited to scale it up and hopefully bring it beyond just the U.S. into the, a global event. Uh, so those are my t my two events. Uh, but they told me I had to do one more thing. <laughs> I didn't really put this in there at all, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we actually have three MLH events coming in 2015. Uh, the last one is a global event that we're, we are, we spend a lot of time talking to hackathon organizers. Uh, and one of the other things I want to do as Major League Hacking is push the, the bar of what's possible. Uh, so we're reimagining what it looks like to have a, a developer event from the ground up. Uh, this summer we're going to be putting on our first ever global event to help uh, shape the future of hackathons and, and you know, give it a really high quality experience for hackers everywhere. Um, so I'm not ready to announce a lot of details around that yet, but we will have more in the coming months. So definitely stay tuned on that. Uh, disclaimer, I definitely, definitely don't think I'm Steve Jobs, but whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, table of contents. Where are we? We're philosophy. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about are some values. Values that I really care about and I think you guys should care about too. And these are things that I think that we need to think about as a community, and these are things I think we can continuously get better at. So the first one is a stronger push for inclusivity. Uh, the code of conduct is just the start. Uh, we need to be working together constantly to get better. And the truth is, you know, alone, we're never going to be able to do this, but as a group, we can definitely make an impact and a difference. Uh, it's subtle things, like having photos on your website that make people feel like they could fit in at an event. Uh, it's the language you use when you describe a hackathon to someone. Uh, it's the, the attitude you have when you're on stage talking to a group of people about the future, right? The truth is all of you can make an impact here, and we always need to be thinking about breaking down barriers and making things more open and inclusive. And I, my call to action to you is, is to make a difference, right? It's not just, you know, things MLH can do. It's things all of us can do. Uh, it's from the ground up. So a stronger push for inclusivity is going to be really important. Another thing that we need to think about is that this is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, oftentimes... As, as a student organizer, you know, the thing that's right in front of you is organizing your next event. But the truth is we need to be thinking about things on a, a, a term that's longer than each semester. It needs to be years, right, not semesters. Um, this movement needs to go on for decades, right? If we believe that this makes a difference, if we actually believe that what we're doing is important, then we need to make it sustainable. And the only way we're going to do that is if we work together. If we're all battling against each other, it's never going to happen. Events like this where we're sharing knowledge and contributing to each other and helping support each other, the stuff that I know all of you are capable with is going to be even more important as time goes on. Uh, so we need to really be thinking about that and thinking about ways that we can work together to make things more sustainable. And the last one is that the format is a little bit stale. And the truth is, like, you know, the last big innovation we had in hackathons was, what, the expo? Uh, <laughs> I think we can do a lot better than that. I really do. Uh, this is just the beginning. We're still at day zero here, right? The truth is we, this is going to go on for decades. This movement is at its infancy. Uh, and the only way that we're going to get there is that we push the limits. And it, limits don't mean, like, changing the branding for your event, right? Like, how you brand it is going to be great, for, and it's going to be really important for getting more people involved and making it more diverse and understandable and accessible to everybody. But branding is just the start, right? Like, that's just a way to incrementally change what we already have. We need to push the boundaries in a radical way. So always be thinking about ways we can serve hackers. Always be thinking about how we can improve the community. Uh, and don't take anything for granted. The things that we used to assume were true, like everybody needs to get on stage and demo in front of everybody, might not be as true as you think they are. So keep that in mind. And the truth is that, you know, <laughs> hackathons changed every single person who's involved in M Major League Hacking's life. Uh, we believe that this movement is literally one of the most important movements going on right now. Uh, we believe that every single person in this room has power to change the world. I want to give a huge shout out to everybody who works at MLH, all the guys in this room, all the hackathon organizers like you guys who are helping shape this movement. Um, I'm really, really excited for 2015 and really, really excited for the future. I hope you guys are too. That's the end of my talk. So I think we have like five minutes for questions and John will help coordinate that.
Swift, what's your favorite breakfast food? My favorite breakfast food, it's oatmeal squares. <laughs> Wait, are you kidding me? Oatmeal squares is literally the best cereal in the world. All right, all right. Yes. So, real quick, if we could go back one slide. Yes. Who's the duck? <laughs> <laughs> the duck is actually a loon. <laughs> That's saying Nick, that represents Nick Quinlan. If you don't know anything about loons, you should definitely ask Nick about that. Shark, do you remember? Who else has questions here? So, yeah. You can shout it, and then John will repeat it. Yeah. Shout it out for you. <laughs> we had 10x growth from 2013, 2014. Are we going to have 20, 10x growth this year too? Uh, the thing is, so the 10x growth uh, is a number of events, right? So the truth is, if if we are being more calculated about the events we put on, we don't need to grow at 10x, right? We can put on events, less events, and accommodate more hackers if we do them like geographically diversely and if we're like thoughtful about it. So I think that you know, 10x growth is impressive in a number of events, but the places we need to really be focusing on growth are in the diversity of the community, the audience size, uh, things that we can impact by making hackathons more accessible. And I think that if we're really thinking about just like raw number of events, and we're not really focusing on where they are, it doesn't actually matter, right? Uh, the truth is like having a hackathon in the Pacific Northwest is, is super important because we don't have anything there right now. The spring season, we have zero events sanctioned in the entire Pacific Northwest United States. That's a huge gap. There's a lot, a lot of people there that we could be serving. So while 10X is impressive, I don't necessarily think it's the right metric to be thinking about. What specific efforts is MLH making to get more women involved in hackathons this year? That is a great question. So uh, a lot of the stuff, like I mentioned before, is around the, like setting a baseline expectation of what's acceptable and making it easier for people to solve the problems that ex already exist in the community. I think that, uh, before, so the Code of Conduct has, has only, the new one has only been in effect for like two or three events so far in this season, and there's five going on right now. Uh, so, you know, after this month, we'll have a lot more data. But even by just having a standardized reporting practice, I actually think that we've had more things reported that usually go unreported through to begin with. And I think that's a huge first step. Uh, we're also always looking for, for ways to partner up to, to you know, help get more women involved in the events, help brand the marketing, help support events that are actually focused on, on getting more women out. Uh, I mean, even something simple, like we had a partnership with HelloFlow where we put uh, feminine hygiene products at every event. Uh, like that's a start, right? Uh, and I don't think we're perfect and I think we're always looking to get better and we're asking a lot of really smart people who are way smarter about this stuff than me. Uh, and if you have any ideas, anybody has ideas, and I, I, gender is like super important. I think we should be focusing on that a lot, but also on racial diversity, socioeconomic diversity. So anything anybody has, like there is a procedure for you know helping submit ideas to MLH for stuff we could be doing. And I think that like a lot of the stuff we can do at a macro level is going to be really important. Uh, and also measuring that stuff because us just doing it blindly and and not really thinking about you know how we go from zero to to one and how successful those things are is also important. Just, just curious. Uh, any talks with Global Hackathon Solo as a foothold into Asia, like MLH <laughs> Asia or anything like that? <laughs> yeah, uh, we actually have a ton of requ inbound requests for support in. I mean, literally all over the world. Like we get tons of, of uh, requests for support, and so we're we're actually rethinking how we can work with events that are outside the leagues that we already have in place. Uh, in order for us to to dedicate a ton of resources to a region, there has to be sufficiently high demand that we can make it efficient. Uh, economically, right? Like supporting events all over the world would be like an insanely expensive endeavor if we, you know, didn't really think about it practically. But that said, like I do think there's ways that we, as MLH and as a community, can help support events all over the world. I, I would love to get involved with with more Asian, specifically Southeast Asia, because I think there's a lot of r demand there. Um, so I think that's coming. I, I don't have a timeline for you on when, but it's something we're definitely thinking about. And then things like the guide are going to be really important for our expansions there as a community because the truth is what they want is our help figuring out the best practices. And if we as a community can write down those best practices in a format that they can consume asynchronously without having to get on the phone with all of us, without having to have on-site support from us, 
without having to have like you know the resources that are our most finite, like time, uh, that's going to help us scale a lot quicker as a community. But yes, I want to. I would love to go to South Korea <laughs> for that event. <laughs> Any other questions? We have time yeah, for two a more. a bunch over here too. Yeah, yell it out. Yeah, so the question is, what is MLH doing specifically to help people who are coming from underprivileged backgrounds? Uh, a lot of us, we all have access in this room to you know this kind of stuff, but not everybody has the same level of access that we do. So one of the things we did last semester, which I'm really proud of, that probably went unnoticed by a ton of people, is uh, through our partnership with Dell, we actually gave away laptops to people who couldn't afford them throughout the, the entire season. Uh, so we gave away a ton of those. Also, uh, we're, we're working on partnering with events to donate laptops to the events so that they can invite students who don't have laptops to come and hack. Because um, I think that, you know, that's one thing that a lot of us take for granted is the fact that we all have a laptop. Like, how many of you, did anybody in this room not have a laptop with them today or this weekend? Like, you know, probably not. Uh, but there are a lot of people out there that don't. And so by us donating, you know, basic equipment through either the hardware lab or some other initiative to events is a great start for, you know, getting uh, people who can't afford the, that kind of equipment to our events. Another thing that's really important is, again, coming back to language and like how we explain these things. I mean, uh, gosh, how do I explain this? So if you, a, a lot of, as developers, we ha sometimes have a tendency to uh, look down upon people who are not developers and don't necessarily understand the concepts that we do. And that's a trend, in a, mac a macro trend in developers in general. It's not specific to student hackathons and not specific to student hackers, but uh, making, things appear accessible to people who are not necessarily, who are just getting started as developers or who are maybe just learning to code or who even don't even know anything yet but like think it's a cool idea is gonna be really important. So not framing your events as like super elite and super you know exclusive is gonna be a big step. And I think one of the things we do as MLH actively is work with events on those kind of things like branding and how they, they present themselves and how they make themselves available to and accessible to, the, to uh, people who are maybe not, not already in the community. One more question. <laughs> One more. That guy saw his hand up first. Yeah. Uh, could, could you be more like specific? I actually have a, I think I understand. So basically you're asking like, have we seen anything like a small situation that occurred that we realized was actually a macro problem and then implemented a solution across, yes. So I actually have a really good example of this, which is in the, the new sanctioning guide and we got a lot of questions about, so it's a great opportunity for me to talk about that. Uh, in the sanctioning guide, we ask you to collect basic data about your attendees uh, so that you have access to it during the event. Uh, and one of the things we ask for is phone number. And we got a lot of questions like, why do we need to collect our attendees' phone numbers? Like, that's ridiculous. But the thing is, I remember being at an event, and we were, the event had just ended, and we were putting all the kids on the bus, like literally everybody on the bus, and somebody was missing, and we had no idea who they were or how to get in touch with them at all. And you know, nobody was friends with them, it was their first hackathon, and we, we literally swept the entire building and could not find this person. We couldn't find a phone number, we couldn't find contact info on Facebook, there was nothing. Uh, if we would have been collecting phone number up front when we checked those people in, we would have been able to call their cell phone and figure out what was going on. Uh, so like that small like situation that occurred, that was the one that like catalyzed it for me and made me realize that it's a really important piece of information for us to all to have as a community. But I, you know, I noticed that small trend and, and I saw it happen at other events in the past and like connected the dots. Uh, so always looking for things like that. I mean, that's like a really small example, but, and I mean, again, the sanctioning guide, like all of it is designed to take like these things that, you know, events do on a one-off basis and turn them into best practices that we could all use. Cool. Awesome. Let's give Swift a round of applause. Thank you.